Hello, this is Eric Strong, and this is the ninth lecture in this series on understanding ABGs. The topic today is normal anion gap metabolic acidoses. The learning objectives are to know the differential diagnosis of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, and to be able to identify the specific etiology of a normal anion gap in an individual patient. Overall, I find the differential diagnosis of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis is the most frustrating of the five major categories of acid-base disorders. It feels just a little more random and less clinically relevant than the other categories, which is really just a manifestation of the fact that these problems, on average, are less acutely important than the pathologies that cause the other disorders. It's also because the renal tubular acidoses in particular are complicated, incompletely understood, and hard to remember. But I will try to keep things as simple as possible. As we will see again with the metabolic alkalosis, there are two major ways to categorize the etiologies of a normal gap acidosis. For the first way, we consider whether the primary problem is located in the GI tract or the kidneys, and whether that primary problem is a gain of hydrogen ions or a loss of bicarbonate. Although calling it a GI problem is a bit of a stretch, hyperalimentation is frequently listed on this differential diagnosis. This basically means that a person is being artificially fed either through tube feeds or TPN at a rate far in excess of what his or her metabolism is able to process. As a consequence of excessive protein loading, there can be buildup of ammonium ion and other acids that exceed the capacity of the kidneys to handle. Specifically in the kidneys, there are two types of renal tubular acidosis, or RTA, which along with renal failure result in a gain of hydrogen, primarily through the kidney's inability to excrete it normally. I will discuss the RTAs quite a bit in a few minutes. Hyperkalemia can also lead to a relative gain of hydrogen through two different mechanisms also discussed later on. Loss of bicarbonate in the GI tract is most commonly the result of diarrhea but can also be due to surgical procedures such as external pancreatic drainage and ureteral diversion. Oral calcium chloride can be converted to calcium carbonate in the gut lumen, providing a pathway for intestinal loss of bicarb. Cholestyramine is an anion exchange resin meant to exchange chloride with bile salts and thus aid in their elimination. However, bicarbonate can also bind to cholestyramine, leading to a metabolic acidosis so this rare side effect is seen predominantly in patients with baseline renal insufficiency. Loss of bicarbonate in the kidneys is really only caused by type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Two additional etiologies of a normal anion gap acidosis that don't clearly fall into the above scheme are infusions of either normal saline or ammonium chloride. The former effect is quite common and I'll talk about it a bit later. On the other hand, ammonium chloride is a rarely used medication indicated only for the treatment of metabolic alkalosis. Because a number of these conditions are uncommon or esoteric, I actually prefer conceptualizing these etiologies according to this chart, placing them into either common or uncommon causes of a clinically relevant acidosis. In the common list are renal failure, diarrhea, type 4 RTA, and infusion of saline. In the uncommon list is everything else. At this point, as I did with the preceding lecture, and as I will do with the next several lectures, I will discuss the more important of these etiologies in more detail one at a time. I will also review a little of the pathophysiology of them along the way. This will provide you the background needed to understand why these specific etiologies cause normal gap metabolic acidoses and why they present the way in which they do. The first group of etiologies to discuss is the renal tubular acidoses. These are a collection of disorders with the shared features of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, a defect in the kidney's ability to maintain acid-base balance, and the absence of overt renal failure. Here's a schematic of a nephron from the kidney that we saw in lecture two, and we'll revisit again in lecture 10. The three major mechanisms of acid-base regulation in the nephron are shown, and each is linked to one type of RTA. Type 1 RTA, also known as distal RTA, is caused by a defect in the collecting duct where hydrogen ions are normally excreted with simultaneous reabsorption of potassium. Type 2 RTA, also known as proximal RTA, 
is caused by a defect in the proximal convoluted tubule, where bicarbonate is normally reabsorbed. Finally, there is type 4 RTA, which is not a kidney problem per se, but rather a deficiency of the hormone aldosterone. The etiologies of type 1 and 2 RTA can be broken down into those that present as children and those that present as adults. When type 1 RTA presents in childhood, the cause is usually one of a number of rare genetic disorders. Occasionally, the RTA is idiopathic, though many of these cases are likely genetic, but we just haven't identified the gene or associated protein defect yet. In adults, etiologies include a variety of autoimmune disorders, uh, best described in Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus, as well as a number of drugs, hypercalciuria, obstructive uropathy, cirrhosis, and chronic toluene toxicity. Type 2 RTA in children is also usually due to various rare genetic disorders or is idiopathic. In adults, it may be due to multiple myeloma, amyloidosis, a variety of drugs, or heavy metal toxicity. This is a good place to point out that type 2 RTA can be further classified as either isolated, in which there is only a defect in the reabsorption of bicarbonate, or it can be part of Fanconi syndrome, in which a defect in the reabsorption of bicarb occurs concurrently with other defects of reabsorption in the proximal tubule. Specific molecules can include glucose, phosphate, and or amino acids. As a general rule, any cause of isolated type 2 RTA can cause Fanconi syndrome, with the exception of acetazolamide. To understand the possible causes of type 4 RTA, I'd like to review a little more of the physiology that controls the actions of aldosterone. I'll review this actually in slightly more detail in Lecture 10, but on a basic level, aldosterone regulation predominantly involves a cascade of hormones and prehormones in the adrenal glands and the kidneys, but also to some extent the liver and lungs. The cascade begins in the liver, where a prehormone called angiotensinogen is produced. Angiotensinogen is converted into another prehormone called angiotensin 1 with the help of the enzyme renin. Renin is produced in the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidney in response to low blood pressure or renal perfusion and requires locally produced prostaglandins. Angiotensin 1 travels in the systemic circulation to the lungs where it is transformed into angiotensin 2 by the angiotensin converting enzyme. Meanwhile, in the adrenal glands, various steroid precursors are converted into either the hormones cortisol or aldosterone and angiotensin II stimulates the synthesis of aldosterone specifically. As you might recall, both angiotensin II and aldosterone affect acid-base regulation in the kidney. Both hormones increase sodium reabsorption, angiotensin II increases bicarb reabsorption, and aldosterone increases both potassium and hydrogen secretion. The net result, as far as acid-base balance is concerned, is a tendency towards metabolic alkalosis. So anything that causes either low renin and or low aldosterone levels can potentially lead to the opposite, a metabolic acidosis. Specifically, there are many medications which interfere with the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis. First and most obviously are the antihypertensive ACE inhibitors, which as their name implies blocks the action of angiotensin-converting enzyme, Angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, have the same end effect. NSAIDs uh, interfere with two steps. They block synthesis of the prostaglandins, which mediate the production and or release of renin. They also block the effect of angiotensin II on aldosterone production. Heparin, even as little as the doses used for DVT prophylaxis, can interfere with the production of aldosterone by its direct toxic effects on the cells of the zona glomerulosa. Cyclosporine and Bactrim both interfere with aldosterone's effect on the distal tubule, as does, of course, aldosterone receptor antagonists such as spironolactone. Here is a list of the etiologies of type 4 RTA. Pathologies that specifically lead to low renin levels include mild to moderate renal insufficiency, especially diabetic nephropathy, NSAIDs, acute glomerular nephropathy, and HIV nephropathy. Pathologies that lead to low angiotensin II levels only include ACE inhibitors and ARBs.
Finally, a more direct problem just with low aldosterone can be due to adrenal insufficiency, known as Addison's disease. It can also be caused by medications as just discussed, such as aldosterone antagonists, heparin, and cyclosporine. In critical illness, high circulating levels of ACTH may shunt steroid precursors towards the synthesis of cortisol and away from aldosterone. Patients with a 21-hydroxylase deficiency form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia also have low aldosterone levels, as do a variety of rare, other rare genetic disorders. I'm going to briefly go over a comparison of the three RTAs so that you are able to distinguish them based on some common lab tests. These cutoffs are going to be just general guidelines and not something to be particularly dogmatic about. Remember that the primary defect with type 1 is distal acidification. With type 2 is reabsorption of bicarb in the proximal tubule. And with type 4, it is hypoaldosteronism. The serum bicarb levels vary such that the lowest levels are seen with type 1 and the highest with type 4. The serum potassium is normal or low with both types 1 and 2, but almost always elevated with type 4. Urine pH is usually inappropriately high with type 1, is variable with type 2, and typically appropriately low with type 4. Finally, fractional excretion of bicarb, which is an uncommonly ordered test unless one is attempting to specifically confirm a diagnosis of type 2 RTA, is elevated in that circumstance, but otherwise low. I'm sure most of you have already wondered, what about type 3 RTA? I haven't actually mentioned that term yet. The term type 3 RTA is inconsistently applied to a rare congenital deficiency of carbonic anhydrase 2, which results in features of both type 1 and type 2 RTA. The vast majority of clinicians, and certainly no one outside of pediatrics and genetics, ever needs to worry about it. Another major cause of a normal anti-gap acidosis is diarrhea. Intestinal secretions distal to the pylorus, including those from the pancreatic duct, are relatively alkaline. As a consequence, a normal gap acidosis frequently accompanies any condition resulting in excessive loss of these secretions. This most commonly occurs with diarrhea, but can also be seen with laxative abuse, external pancreatic drainage, an enterocutaneous fistula, and vomiting secondary to a distal small bowel obstruction in which the vomited bicarbonate from intestinal secretions can outweigh the vomited hydrogen ions in stomach acid. In renal failure, once creatinine clearance drops below approximately 40 milliliters per minute, ammonium excretion in the distal tubule begins to diminish. As a consequence of retained hydrogen ions, a normal anti-gap acidosis develops. This is usually, but not always, accompanied by an elevated gap acidosis as a consequence of retained phosphate, sulfate, urate, and hypurate, all of which are unmeasured anions. The normal anion gap component of the acidosis can be treated with either oral sodium bicarbonate or with a low protein diet as protein metabolism is the major source of ammonia. Infusions of normal saline, particularly in patients who are volume replete, can lead to a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Although there is very strong anecdotal evidence of this effect, there is a relatively poor understanding as to the exact mechanism or its clinical significance which is thought to be relatively low. The acidosis reverses very quickly once saline is stopped, provided the patient has normal renal function. Dorito diversions are a collection of surgical procedures predominantly used to redirect flow of urine after surgical removal of the bladder. Here is a picture of an ileal conduit in which a small segment of ileum is removed from the normal course of the GI tract. The ureters are implanted into one end and the other end is sewn to the outer abdominal wall to form a stoma. Only urine and minimal intestinal secretions will flow out of the stoma, which is known as a urostomy. The mechanisms by which ureteral diversions can cause an acidosis are complex and vary slightly depending upon the specific procedure in question. However, this problem is most prominent when the ureters are implanted into the sigmoid colon. This is known as a ureterosigmoid ostomy. Here is a simple schematic outlining the two major mechanisms by which metabolic acidosis occurs here. First, chloride in the urine enters the sigmoid colon, 
where an anion exchange pump allows chloride to be removed from the sigmoid lumen in exchange for bicarbonate being pumped inside, where it eventually is eliminated in the stool. The second mechanism involves urea, which encounters urea-splitting bacteria normally present in the sigmoid. These bacteria break urea down into ammonium ion, which is then directly reabsorbed back through the gut wall using a process not yet entirely understood. The net result is excretion of bicarb and reabsorption of hydrogen, which results in the acidosis. The final etiology I will talk about today is hyperkalemia. There are two major mechanisms by which hyperkalemia can lead to a metabolic acidosis. For the first, let me show you a schematic of a cell where these yellow disks will represent potassium ions and the green ones will represent hydrogen. In the presence of hyperkalemia, there is a shift of potassium from the extracellular space to the intracellular space in exchange for a shift of hydrogen from the intracellular space to the extracellular space. For the second mechanism, here again is a diagram of the nephron. You may remember from lecture two that hypokalemia is a stimulus in the collecting duct for potassium reabsorption simultaneous with hydrogen excretion in order to maintain electrical neutrality. Well, the opposite also holds true in that hyperkalemia interferes with this process, thus preventing hydrogen excretion from occurring normally. This, in essence, can physiologically mimic a mild type 1 RTA. For the final segment in this lecture, I will talk a little bit about the urine anion gap, which will then lead into a discussion of an approach to diagnosing the etiology of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. The urine anion gap, which I will subsequently abbreviate it UAG, is somewhat analogous to the serum anion gap discussed in detail in lecture 5. The calculation is slightly different, however. In this case, it is the urine sodium plus the urine potassium minus the urine chloride. So what exactly is this calculation telling us? Well, here is a diagram of the normal breakdown of various positively charged cations and negatively charged anions in the urine. As you can see, the cations are composed predominantly of sodium and potassium with a small contribution from some unmeasured cations, which are predominantly ammonium, while the anions are chloride with a slightly larger contribution from the unmeasured anions, which are predominantly phosphates and sulfates. The urine anion gap is essentially this difference here. In most causes of metabolic acidosis, here is what changes. Now, in the kidney's effort to get rid of as much extra acid as possible, there is a much greater amount of ammonium, which significantly increases the amount of unmeasured cations. In this situation, the urine anion gap will be very low, or in the specific case illustrated here, the urine anion gap may even be negative. So in essence, the urine anion gap is an indirect measure of the urine ammonium, which cannot be easily measured directly. Once again, in the normal case, ammonium is low, so the urine anion gap will be positive, anywhere from positive 20 to positive 90 molar equivalents per liter. In most forms of acidosis, the ammonium will be high, so the urine anion gap will be low or negative, anywhere from negative 50 to positive 20 molar equivalents per liter. Metabolic acidoses that are not associated with a negative or near zero urine anion gap must be associated with impairment in the excretion of ammonium in the distal tubule. This includes only chronic kidney disease and types 1 and 4 RTA. So at this point, let me present you one possible approach to determining the etiology of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. This is not the only approach, it's just the one that I personally find the most useful. The first step is to either stop any infusion of normal saline or switch it to lactated ringers. If this caused the acidosis to resolve, then excessive saline infusion was the sole explanation. If the acidosis persists, then check if the creatinine clearance is less than 40 milliliters per minute. If so, then renal failure is the most likely explanation. If creatinine clearance is greater than 40, then assess the serum potassium urine pH, and urine anion gap. If the potassium is normal or low, urine pH is low, and urine anion gap is either low or negative, 
then that GI cause is the explanation. The specific etiology will almost always be evident from history at this point. If the potassium is normal or low, the urine pH relatively high, and the urine anion gap high, then type 1 RTA is the cause. If potassium is normal or low and the urine anion gap is low or normal, then type 2 RTA is the most likely cause. This can be confirmed by measuring a fractional excretion of bicarbonate. If the potassium is high, urine pH low, and urine anion gap high, then type 4 RTA is the explanation. Finally, if the potassium is extremely high, uh, such as above 7, and urine pH low, then hyperkalemia is the explanation in and of itself. Of course, hyperkalemia has its completely separate differential diagnosis that I won't get into at this point in time. So that concludes this lecture on the etiologies of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Please continue on to lecture 10, which will discuss the etiologies of a metabolic alkalosis.